So the sermon this morning is based on the Old Testament reading from Job, the 38th chapter. And uh, you'll see that it starts uh, at uh, verse 4, but you can't go into verse 4 without uh, getting the first three verses of the, of the 38th chapter of Job because it's such a, a big setup uh, where it says, And then God answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Dress yourself for action like a man. I'm going to question you, and you're going to answer me. Where were you when I dot, dot, dot? Grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our risen and ascended and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So as someone who has worked in the creative field, something that is always interesting to me is the dynamic between the art that is created, uh, the creator of that art, and the people who become fans of it. And I understand all sides of the issue because those of us who are fans feel a special connection to what is created. We can become so passionate about it that we even feel like maybe it belongs to us. But those who create these pieces of art do so most times with an intent to relay a message or to evoke an emotion. Now, art is usually uh, created to be interpreted in some fashion, but there is more times than not also a specific meaning behind the art. So, who gets to say what the real meaning is behind something? Who gets to be the authority on that matter? Well, it's always the one who is the creator of the art. They're the ones who took it out of thin air and gave it life, who made it come into existence, who created it for a purpose. But that doesn't stop some people from thinking that we have the right to claim it as our own and also lay claim to being the authorities on the matter. That, this happens all the time. Maybe you remember a few years back when author J.K. Rowling was taking criticism uh, for something that she had created within the Harry Potter book series, and it wasn't uh, any of her views on, on social issues which is what she takes criticism for today. But fans of the Harry Potter series criticized her for the way that she finished some of the storylines in the series. I love the way she handled that criticism. She reminded her fans lovingly that she and nobody else is the author of this entire universe and that she had this whole story sorted out in her head several years before the first book was even published, let alone all the movies that followed. Or what about the character from the movie Scarface and the character Mon Tony Montana? That was written as a warning to anybody who wanted to live like a gangster. But no matter how hard the creators of the story and the movie try to convince others to never live like this guy, go into any mall today where you can either see a bunch of kids wearing Scarface shirts or you can go in into a number of stores and buy them. They cannot convince people that this guy, Tony Montana, is not a hero. Doesn't matter how many times the songwriter Sting tries to tell somebody that every breath you take is about stalking someone and is a very sinister song and should not be played at the first dance at your wedding, <laughs> people still want to put their own meaning on that song. This happens all the time. Art is created, people claim ownership of it, and misinterpret it. And when we do this, we're forgetting a truth, that these things were, in fact, created with a purpose and a meaning and a message, and that there is an authoritative source on this matter, and it's the creator of that art. And I think there is a striking similarity between that concept and our text from Job today. Where God Almighty, in a very certain way, tells Job and anybody who will read this that he is the all capital letters author, not just of some pieces of art. He is the author of the heavens and life and everything. And who are we, his creations, to question how he operates? See, that's a mistake that the human race has been making since the fall into sin questioning God and challenging him. It's what we do all the time. 
But this text really speaks to us and reminds us of the pecking order of the universe. Are we God's most important creation? Absolutely. But we are his creation. We're not God. And so that means we need to interact with him in a particular way that can be as open as your heart desires, but always needs to be in a way that honors and respects the fact that he is God and that we are his creatures. And life is just much better when we operate with this first commandment reminder. In fact, let's put it up there on the wall. We need to trust in God above all things, but unfortunately, a lot of the time, we put all things above God. And that's what I want to talk about today on the back of Job 38 and how God wants us to have a relationship with him so that we might better know him and treat him as he wants to be treated, believe in him as he wants to be believed in, which when we do that, you know what happens, guys? It works out really well for you and me. And it gives us a power to live that changes every facet of our lives. One of my professors at the seminary used to continually say that God is God. In fact, uh, Pastor Sharp and I talk about this professor uh, all the time in this concept. Uh, Tim is going to be learning from this professor as he goes uh, to the seminary starting here uh, in just a couple of weeks. And that was the thing he said all the time. That was kind of his answer for every question. God is God. God is God. Followed closely by the second answer he gave all the time, which is, you're going directly to hell. That's another uh, sermon that we're going to have at another time. Yeah. But it is so crucial for us to understand this and get it locked into our minds. We're not God. And that means that as his creations, we have been given a particular way to approach life. And it's one that when we let him be God and not try and step into his giant God-sized shoes, it's actually very liberating and freeing for us. So that statement, God is God, that can be troubling and threatening when you want to be God. But if you want to let him do his job and receive what he wants to give you, it's a life-changing power to live in. God is God is not a buzzkill or a threat. That truth is a great promise and a great reality for us. You know why? Because God takes care of things that you and I cannot take care of. I was reminded of this when I was back in the Northwest for the last couple of weeks. So my uh, brother has a place uh, on Hayden Lake in in Idaho. And for the first time that I can remember in 41 years of of being around this this place, there were fires very, very near the lake and the homes on the lake. And I, I took a picture. Let's put it up there, Jack. Okay, here's a photo of what that looked like from our dock. And this is just over the other side of the mountain. Started with a small single light. And then it spread to a couple of acres. And before you knew it, it was a thousand plus acres strong. It's still burning as we speak right now. And as they were reporting on this fire, they uttered the words that nobody in the Northwest ever wants to hear because we know what they mean. And it's these words. Let's put them up there. The fire is at zero percent containment. When a fire is spreading that quickly in the mountains in August, it is a bad, bad thing. And as I heard that first report, I got to thinking, that's a great illustration for sin, isn't it? That's how the effects of our sins work. They spread so fast and they go so far that our sins are doing their damage halfway around the world before we've even recognized that we've committed them. And you know what happens when we recognize that and try and stop them? We can't do it. Sin is too big of a fire for you and me to handle. We have 0% chance of containing it, let alone defeating it. But God is God. And it's not too big of an issue for him to handle. That's why he sent his son. Jesus Christ came to contain and defeat sin. In fact, defeat sin so much that when God sounds the alarm and says it's time, he's going to lock up sin in its own specially designed prison forever and ever. 
And so if we ever think that we have a better grasp on this than God, which we do at times, that's why we have to have the first commandment, I think it's good for us as believers to always compare our power to his and compare the results of our activities to his. And we can do it in this simple equation. Let's put it up there on the wall. See, we create sin. He creates forgiveness. We create death. He creates life. We create separation. He offers salvation. God is God. And that means great things for anybody who will have what he's offering. And that truth gives us great power to live in right now. Because if God can take care of the eternal problems of sin and death, which again, remember, we cannot, then doesn't that change how we live right here and right now? That's why Job is such a great example for us to learn from. Will there be times when we don't understand the timetable and the plan that God is executing around us? Oh, absolutely. Life can get pretty confusing at times, but it's never so confusing that it's cause for despair. When we are connected to God, we're always connected to the one who empowers us to stare straight into the face of our trials and struggles and handle them in a new way, knowing that the God who is with us has defeated all of those things. And if God is with us, and if he is for us, who can be against us? So one of the most helpful things about the story of Job is that it redirects us to ask the right questions during the times of trial. See, as we're going through them, that's the temptation to start asking the wrong questions and get into a rabbit hole or down some path that will take us into places that God doesn't want us to be. But in this text, God tells us how to do this. He tells us to remember where the power is from and who has it. But he also teaches us an incredibly important lesson about what to do as we're in the middle of these things and sufferings and troubles. We see a great example of what not to do in Job. Because he's experiencing all of these problems, and what does he do? He wants to know why. And it's really the wrong way of thinking in these situations. We all do this, right? Why is this happening? In earlier chapters of the book, Job asked God to answer him, why is this happening? And tell him why these terrible things are going on in his life. He's questioning whether God is just and if he rules in a fair way. In other words, he's looking for an answer that suits his own perception of what is right and fair rather than leave up this to the source of goodness himself. He's criticizing the way that God has designed and is running things. And that's one of the reasons we need to be so familiar with this text and with Job's mistakes so that you and I don't make them. Why do bad things happen to us? Well, in a sinful world, bad things happen to all people. And so the question to ask in the middle of tough times is not why, because God doesn't always answer that for us. In fact, most times he doesn't. The question to ask in the middle of tough times is this one. Let's put it up there. Who? As in who can save us from this terrible situation that we are in? Because it's in that question that you will find the answer. And this is what God tells us to do. If we're fixated on the why question, we will literally go crazy. And God, again, in his loving mercy, wants to protect us from that. When we are exerting our energy on finding out why bad things happen to us, you know what happens? We can actually miss out on the good things that God wants to do for us. And here's the deal, guys. Life is difficult enough living in a broken and sinful world. We don't need to make it worse by rejecting the help of the only one who can help us and who wants to give us power for living in this busted up world. God is God, and he is offering the access to him and his power to live our lives. You know, Job 38 and what follows, it's one of my favorite texts in all of Scripture. But it took a long time for that to be the case. In fact, I used to not read the book of Job because this part scared me so badly. 
But as I grew in my knowledge of God through his word, I gained a whole new appreciation for this text because it tells me that God doesn't want to use his sovereign power to destroy me. He wants me to come to him and understand his power and love and trust in him and be saved by him. That's what his power is for, and that's why he tells us about it. See, only the God who can create the universe and lay the earth's foundations and command the sea and hold back the waves is big enough to save me for eternity. And that's what this is all about. He wants to use his power to save all of us. He wants you to use his power to change the way that you approach living today. And that's the message for all of us that we're called to take into our lives and to live with. You know, pastors might have degrees hanging on our walls that show we've been educated and we've been trained theologically in a seminary. Truth of the matter is, so much of what we learn as pastors comes from getting to know you guys. And that certainly is the case uh, for me. One of the biggest lessons I've learned as a pastor about letting God be God and about the love of God came from a, a member at my first congregation. Her name is, is Linda Hertzing. And I, I asked for permission 14 years ago when all of this was going on, or 15 years ago, to, uh, to talk about her in the pulpit from, in, in my ministry. So Linda Hertzing, I call her the Job of Madison County, Illinois. Life was going along very nicely in the fall of 2007 when the problem started. A couple of weeks before uh, Thanksgiving in November, Linda's, uh, Linda got that phone call. She and her husband, Glenn, got that phone call. Their daughter, Missy, had died of a heroin overdose. Then her husband, Glenn, a couple weeks later was having headaches, went into the doctor and was diagnosed with an aggressive form of brain cancer. He died in January of 2008. When she went back to work in February, she was told that she was being let go after 17 years of employment at this place. And in the mix, in between all of these things, tons of family issues, tons of financial problems, and tons of legal things were going. It was rough. And Linda didn't deny any of that. Every Tuesday morning, she and I would get together in my office and, and we would go over the Word of God and we would pray and we would talk about everything that is happening. And in the middle of everything, she said something that is so biblically profound that it stuck with me ever since. And she said this, I don't know why any of this is happening. And it is really confusing. And it really hurts but I know that God loves us. And maybe he was protecting us all from something even worse. I was like, oh man, I am so jealous of your spiritual maturity. I was like, you get this. In the middle of trials, you look to the one who has the power to save, deliver, and give peace, knowing that he loves you and knows what's best for you and we'll do what's best for you. And he can do that. Because the God who can create the planets and hold back the waves can do anything he promises you. And that's exactly what he has done in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The greatest thing we ever needed. Only that God was big enough to come to earth and take on the form of human flesh. Big enough to go to the cross and be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Big enough to give us the power to face the sufferings that come along with living in a broken world. God is God all of the time. No matter what is happening, God is God. And he has the power and he loves you. Even when one of the most beautiful islands in the world is on fire and people are dying, yeah, God is God. Even when our culture is spinning out of control, God is God. Even when my personal failures threaten my life and those I love, yeah, God is God. Even when a 17-year-old boy dies of brain cancer in our community, yeah, God is God. And he wants you to know how much he loves you, even when you don't understand what's going on in life. 
When that happens and you are wondering if God is in control and if he loves you, you look to the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no more powerful, powerful or expensive display of love than that. He spent the blood of his only son to love and save you and me. And that gives us power, power to live eternally, power to erase our past, and power to handle the challenges that we face in living in this sinful world. God is God, and let's thank him for that every single day. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you that you work the way that you do because your way does in fact work. Thank you for having the power that you do, and thank you for having the love that you do as well. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, and we ask that you would help us with the wisdom that comes from above to follow your direction for our lives, which works out so well for us if we'll just uh, abide by your word. And we ask all this in the name of the one who makes that possible, our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.